So, and thanks to Cal Chiefs again for putting this together. It's been, been an incredible event, and um, I know some of the friendships I've made will, will carry forward for, for some time. Um, you know, most of us got in the fire service or got into public safety because we wanted to help people. I know some of you got into the fire service because you want to break stuff, but some of us got in the fire service because we wanted to help our neighbors, right, and support our neighbors. And then at some point you feel an obligation to provide that service. You know, you develop that over the years. And that goes into why we become leaders, right? Why we apply for promotion and why you get in the positions you're in today. And your obligation now is not only to help your neighbors, but to help your firefighters as they respond to some of these events and some of these incidents and be able to provide the safest environment you can um, and then have the most effective response that you can for your customer, for your taxpayer. And we can add to the efficiencies of those responses and add to the safety and accountability of our firefighters through the use of technology. And you've seen some excellent demonstrations from some of our partners um, over the last two days. And I hope that you, as you move forward, you engage in some of these solutions to provide that safer, more effective response uh, for your firefighters and for your customers. But I want you to understand as well, and you know, if you don't take anything else away, is that we at Esri Public Safety and our partners have an obligation or feel an obligation to help you complete your mission. So certainly if you didn't get my contact information, um, get it before the end of the day and you know, reach out anytime you have a need and I get an excellent example of how we meet that obligation at Esri is our disaster response program. And you've heard that mentioned a few times uh, over the last couple of days, last few sessions. Uh, but that's, you know, that's not a money-making activity for Esri. That is something where we're there to support the community, support the responders, and help restore communities after significant events. And you heard Petter has been involved with some, and, and the hurricanes, and what um, Chief Doolin spoke of during the response to the hurricanes and supporting state USAR teams. You know, that's, that's part of that disaster response program, and I think a, a glaring example of how we support public safety uh, by the Esri public safety team. So, Now, we all understand the, the responsibilities and the roles of leadership in the fire service, and I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but there's not any point in your operation, uh, any point in your daily responsibilities, that you can't use some of these technologies to improve the outcome, to, to add efficiencies to it. And the, um, the issues we face today, you can't just continue to throw firefighters and build fire stations and buy fire trucks because our changing environment and the, the speed of which these emerging threats show up every day, it, you just don't have the time. You can't keep up the pace. You know, for, to, to fund and build and staff a fire station is a three to five year cycle, right? And I'll give you a great example of you know, the, um, the city of Annapolis and dealing with the opioid crisis recently, the, the city decided that every police and fire station would be a safe haven that if anybody needed you know, assistance or, or treatment or rehab, they show up at a fire station. Well, that you know, got cut on in a month or two. It's not like they added staff or they had the real ability to, to take that extra workload at the firehouse. And that's a significant issue. So people banging on the door at the fire station on a regular basis. So what they did to, to deal with that issue is they used technology. And, and the, the big problem they had was somebody would show up at the door and they had no idea where to send them. They had several treatment centers throughout the city and the surrounding counties, but it, it would take hours to find out where a bed was and then what, how do we transport them there, because that's always an issue. Um, so they actually worked with the treatment centers and worked with their, their city GIS to have a dashboard view in the fire station. So when somebody banged on the door, they could say, all right, we're taking them to the treatment center on Main Street. And it just improved that process. And that was the way they dealt with that emerging threat and were able to provide a better service to their citizens and to their customers. So the technology implementation still, though, has to have a plan, right? Much like Chief Johnson, uh, Russ spoke of yesterday, that leadership governance and policy. And actually, Chief Doolin brought it up again as well. You know, we don't buy a million dollar piece of fire apparatus without some operational policies, right? We don't buy a million dollar piece of fire apparatus without a training program to put it in service. And, and these products are no different. So you have to have that leadership in place. You have to have developed those policies and procedures and have a plan for implementation and then maintenance of those technologies. So <clears throat> I know some of these themes are getting repetitive, but because they're true, right? So we need to use that science of where to make good decisions. And ultimately what I consider um, GIS is, is, is a communications platform. The ability to wrap any data that you can get your hands on into one common view and then communicate it to anybody that's involved, any stakeholder, any decision maker. You can you know, scrub it, make it look pretty, and present it to the public. Uh, but we all have access to data that we can use to make better decisions throughout an operational period, even administrative functions, you know, day to day operations, whatever the case may be. And um, most of you in this room already have access to this, right? Most of us in the room at least have access to the infrastructure to start, to start implementing these solutions. And what's incredible is the ease of use and what used to take you know, a very highly trained, and you still need GIS professionals, don't get me wrong, so if there's any in the back, 
getting ready to throw stuff at me. You know, you still need that GIS, preferably under the fire chief. Um, but the ability now for web GIS to be able to have firefighters and fire stations making products on a regular basis, doing that analysis on data and making decisions based on a web browser. You know, no, no desktop software needed, just a login and you're flying, you're taking off. And I know uh, Jeff had showed this slide earlier, this is my slide, he stole it, so just like a chief, take somebody else's stuff and take credit for it. But no, it's an excellent example of a firefighter creating a useful product during a response. We had a marina fire, we lost about 15 vessels. Not so funny part of it, the one vessel right in the middle was our brand new fireboat, which had been convenient to have, you know, to put the marina fire out. But yeah, we lost a $700,000 fireboat in the middle of this fire. But that map, while it's certainly not the prettiest map you've seen um, throughout the last day or two, was made by a lieutenant in our situation unit, our IMT, within about an hour and a half of the response. And what's incredible about that map is it's not so much for the, the guys on the end of the hose line at this point, because they're still fighting active fire when he created this map, but we had five fireboats from other localities coming to us. We had the Coast Guard, we had the EPA, um, several other state agencies, our State Department of Environmental Quality, things, or responders like that. And with one email and one link, anybody responding to us could see exactly where the event was, they could see where the hazmat release was, they had a, a route to get to it and where the staging locations were, where we had booming already in place. And that was just a click on an email. Right? Didn't matter what radio system they were using, didn't matter what kind of computer they had, didn't matter what, you know, what, what apparatus they were operating. Everybody had that same common operating picture, completed by a firefighter in the back of a command bus, you know, on the side of a river by the, uh, by the marina. So <clears throat> incredibly powerful. And, and the picture on the left, that's how we're starting. Nobody's advocating. You know, we're still doing T cards, right? You know, we still got the dry erase board in the back of the Italian car. But when the, with that expanding incident, we have to be able to communicate uh, to other agencies and collaborate and, I'm, I'm sorry, um, coordinate multi-agency response. And web GIS allows us to do that. So I always, um, I say always, I often show this video, so if you've seen it before, I apologize. And yes, I'm in it, I, and the camera does add 10 or 15 pounds. Um, but this, is, this video is one of our special events, and Esri actually uh, produced this video. But it's an actual, excellent example of the flexibility of WebGIS and field applications to manage a relatively significant event, at least for us. So. When uh, public safety agencies are responding to a major incident, it's really critical that they're able to share information with each other, not only to respond to the incident, but to keep responders safe and for us to effectively do our jobs. And that's really been a challenge. On a normal day, when you call 911, you give an address. Well, of course, at a, at a large, complex incident, or event rather, like the Richmond races, it's on a property that isn't your normal environment where you have addresses. So people can't say, I'm at 123 Main Street. They're using a lot of landmarks. Years ago, we were attempting to develop solutions from scratch. We were trying to find a way to manage and track outside resources that are not part of Henrico County. We would spend our time drawing maps, hand drawing, uh, across the county, one station would have the maps for that area. If they were out on a call, another company would be running into their district, they would not have any maps for that area. Then we stepped up and started using ArcGIS Online. By having a living map, it gets rid of a lot of the problems that paper maps cause. When you pull up AGOL or one of the dashboards, you have the latest and greatest map and the information is updated real time. By the very nature of our business, we're dealing with incidents or events that change rapidly. At this event, we'll have easily 100,000 people attending, and, and in the past, we would receive a 911 call from somewhere on the property, and, and a person would give us a general description of where they are, and we would have to flood that area with responders. In the process of doing that, we might not even necessarily know which of our responders are engaged on that call and where they are, and, and so you wind up having a lot of duplication of effort and not necessarily the most efficient use of resources. With the collector app, we can go out and we can geotag all of these landmarks and plot their location on the common operating picture and then also make the description of those points searchable for the uh, communications officer. We have over 1,200 personnel that are on the ground providing public safety services. So that's everything from police to emergency medical services, fire suppression. The incident commanders in the command post are able to monitor the common operating picture and the mapping system we've established from a desktop. At the same time, our division group supervisors that are out in the field are utilizing a mobile device to determine where their resources are, where they need to be shifted to cover gaps in our service provision. And then you may have the individual responder that has a smartphone 
They can see where the incidents are related to them and what facility is the closest to take an injured patient. While all that's going on, off-site you have an emergency operations center that is using the operations dashboard to monitor what resources are being utilized and they can see ahead of time if we're running out of resources at our special event and they can start moving or coordinating the movement of additional resources to support our operations. Using ArcGIS Online as an integrated platform for data sharing has really allowed us to create that common operating picture so that all of our responders, regardless of whether they're police, fire, emergency medical services, state and federal agencies, all have the same situational awareness. We're trying to stay ahead of the curve for once. We're not reactive to it. We're trying to get ahead, pre-plan, and do all those things that better prepare us for what we're dealing with. Situational awareness is everything. If you can't adapt to what's going on, if you don't recognize changes, you're behind. Providing these services requires boots on the ground. It requires people that are caring, committed, and professional. The ArcGIS online tool for us and the support from Esri has allowed us to provide those people with the tools that they need to respond effectively, to have information at their fingertips, to share that information, and to be more efficient in their response. So flexible, right? Apply those same tactics to any planned or no-notice event, right? Ground search or, or wildfire, whatever it might be. So the tools are there, you just have to engage them to provide the safety and security and, and efficient operations for your personnel. A great, a great story from one of our special events from that, from that racetrack is we had a derecho event, which you know, straight, straight line winds 80, 90 miles an hour. And we're able to track where our mobile resources were and make sure you know, that they had gotten to a shelter location before the, before the storm actually came in. Obviously we saw the storm coming on, on, on the dashboard because that was one of the layers we added um, to our operations dashboard. And then scalability. And you know, I had a discussion um, yesterday about some evacuation uh, public information products and evacuation routes, and Florida put one up. And you know, you could do this kind of thing internally on your own servers, certainly. But are you are you prepared to take 40 or 50 million hits in a day? And which I think it was about 40 million hits on the evacuation map. You know, the the scalability of WebGIS and, and the cloud-based systems allows you to take this kind of workload, provide this kind of service to the public, and be able to handle it. So the scalability is incredibly important as well. Um, and in talking about public information, it's not just a one-way communication, right? We can mine this data, this, this social media data, or, or actually have specific products where you know, a resident or a customer can go to a website and provide you information that you specifically, specifically ask for. Or in the case of, um, this is, I believe, Texas, um, Natsig, one of our partners, actually pulled social media data, and when they could verify a location and, and have a valid location, they put it on the map. And so you're sitting in the EOC or command post, and as you zoom in on the map, you can actually see where these pictures are. So you can, I mean, I know that's not a formal damage assessment, but that's an excellent, excellent way to start doing a size up of what the impact to your community is. And again, that's just the public providing that, that information. And then Jeff already got, gave a good overview of the, the field applications they used during the hurricane. So yeah, I just stole his slide back, not knowing he was doing that. So anyway, but again, the ease of use. So firefighters, use our teams, literally downloading an application while they're en route and being taught over a telephone how to use that field application and then being able to provide real-time data to the emergency operations center and the command, um, command structure that was involved in these wide area searches. So I mean, it's turning the firefighters into human sensors. And that's, you know, that's an incredibly um, important, that real-time aspect, incredibly important to make good decisions. You know, because I mean, we were part of, uh, part of Task Force Two in Virginia Beach and you, know, you did field collections with a GPS device but it was, it was not connected, and basically you do a 12-hour operational period, you come back to the base, and you drop this thing off, and somebody pulls the, 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 the memory stick out and puts it in the computer, they upload everything, so then the information you're seeing is 16 hours old. This information is 15 seconds old. And you're, you know, it's popping up on the map in front of you, you click on it, you can see a picture or whatever data they collected, so incredibly effective. And then you also saw a workforce demonstration um, in Florida, this is 10 days later, in Florida, they added the, the workforce application to this workflow, and they were actually able to manage resources. So if you remember in Florida, they had some issues with nursing homes a few days after the, the storm left because, you know, without power, couldn't support patients. So they actually had um, fire resources go do inspections or, or assessments of, of nursing homes. Well, these resources were from out of state. They were EMAC requests. So they don't know the road network. They don't know the community. They don't know the facilities they're going to. But in workforce, they were able to assign work to them, route them to a facility, have them do a, an, um, a survey one, two, three, um, survey and upload the data back to, to the Florida Emergency Operations Center. So provided for a much more efficient workflow, 
provided some safety for those folks that didn't know where they were because they had routing and, and, and mapping to get there, and then provided instant data back to the emergency operations center as they inspected several hundred, um, <clears throat> several hundred nursing homes. And then damage assessment applications, it's very flexible. So whatever your need is on the, on the Survey123 side, you can make that form whatever it is. We've got um, fire districts using Survey123 to do daily apparatus checks. I said, well, what, you know, that, that, I was, why are you doing that? Daily apparatus checks, you know, checking the engine every day. <clears throat> well, their fleet management, you know, when they had a reserve piece of apparatus, engine six is always engine six. Doesn't matter what unit they're actually riding on, right? But they did a survey one, two, three, and actually used the, the, the vehicle number. And then when they go back and look at their data, they can say, well, you know, engine six was actually engine 342 or whatever their shop number is. And they can actually track where that reserve engine was or where that primary unit was in their locality. So they knew how long you know, a particular unit or a particular station was on a, on a reserve. And, but it, it, in other words, it helped their fleet maintenance. So I thought that was pretty, pretty um, uh, unique, the way they applied that. <clears throat> and then talking about you know, our community risk reduction um, and the ability to prevent and then serve our community on the community risk reduction side. And an important part of that is the risk assessment. And you, and you saw some demonstrations of, of off-the-shelf um, products for us and our solutions. Again, go to that Esri.Solutions page and look at those fire and emergency management uh, resources. But the ability to identify target hazards without having to inspect every one. You have the data. You own the data to be able to identify what, are your, what structures in your community are most hazardous to your firefighters and most haz hazardous to the citizens. That parcel layer, that tax layer data, I mean, it provides you, as, as uh, Kevin got into a little bit, you know, how many stories is it? Does it have a basement? Some of them even get into what kind of roof structure it is. You know, what, you know, structural components and things of that nature. So it can be very, very detailed. You just have to know where to go get it and know how to evaluate it. And so <clears throat> the off-the-shelf um, solution uh, comes with four or five different, I think, variables to, to evaluate to determine that, that rating. But again, that's flexible. You know, we did things like add a basement. If it had a basement to us, that was a higher risk. So we added some, some uh, weight to that assessment based on, on a basement being present or not. Um, had uh, had a gentleman or a fire captain from Tennessee, they had a close call with a residential elevator. And a firefighter almost fell down the residential ele elevator shaft during a fire. Well, he was able to go back and start looking through their tax parcel data and some of their business inspection data and start pulling in which homes had, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, residential elevator. Because that's not something normally we inspect and you pull up at the front door, you might not be aware of that. It'd be a hard way to find it that's fine and down, falling down the elevator shaft. And continuing the risk assessment of identifying fire problems or any problem, you know, that's typically the CAD data we get out of our CAD systems. And, and yeah, that tells us a lot. We had a lot of fires. We had some fire loss. But again, to be able to put it on a map and start to see trends and start to see concentrations and, and be able to focus prevention efforts uh, based on what is actually occurring in your community. And uh, one way we did, we did that was we had six fire deaths in about 40 days, and that's, that was a pretty high rate for us. And uh, so we wanted to do targeted home safety surveys and smoke alarm installations, because I think five of the six had no working smoke alarms. So instead of just going out and hitting neighborhoods and, and going to every door, we did a risk assessment. <clears throat> and the risk assessment went through type of structure, last time it was sold, um, things like the, what kind of heating system it had, if it had you know, some kind of fuel-fired heat, and things of that nature. Also added some demographic information, which you see here, which Esri provides in the tapestry layer. And, um, and then also added some CAD data. So if they had, say, three falls in six months, or repetitive calls to that address over a few months, we consider that a higher risk. So once we put that program in place, mobile application on the MDC and the engine, uh, the firefighters, if they happen to be driving by one, could just stop and do a home safety survey if they knew, or it was assigning them automatically. Every unit got five a week, because we we're trying to do 7,000 a year. So every unit got assigned five a week. But of the doors they knocked on and got an answer, 90% needed assistance. So when they actually had contact with a customer, nine out of 10 needed a smoke alarm. That's incredible. I mean, I wish I had something to sell and could have that kind of success rate. So a completely efficient method to identify where the risk is and then take care of the risk. So they weren't wasting time going through a whole neighborhood knocking on every door. They were going to the homes that we knew needed assistance. So incredibly powerful way to use the data. And then, <clears throat> I know I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. Um, a risk assessment, and so those of you familiar with the accreditation process, and, and I'm sure you do it anyways as part of your normal day-to-day -day responsibilities, but you go through a risk assessment of your community. And a lot of, um, or it's, it's allowed to be done by fire district, and that's where a lot of fire departments do it. But with GIS, you can do every address point. You can look at every structure in your community based on that tax parcel data um, and, and do an assessment on every individual 
um, every individual structure. And that completely changed the way we deployed resources. So typically, you know, a, a commercial structure was a commercial structure, a residential single family was a single family, and a multifamily was a multifamily. They all got the same dispatch, right? Single family got three engines in a truck, commercial got three engines and two trucks, and that was the way we did it. But some of our homes are 6,500, 7,000 square feet, right? You know, some, you know, we want to send the same thing to a 7-Eleven that we send to a hospital. So we actually do this risk assessment once a month, uploaded to our CAD system, so the dispatcher doesn't even have to determine what kind of structure it is. Once they determine a location, it pulls from that data and then uh, deploys the resources appropriately. So now we, you know, we'll send four engines and two trucks to a commercial smaller one, but we might spend, send five engines and three trucks to what we consider our, our high hazard, special hazard. So it completely changed the way we deployed resources. And nobody had to go out and do an inspection. Nobody had to go drive up and down the street and look for stuff. It was all data we already owned and just didn't know we had it. And then John covered the Living Atlas. Um, thousands and thousands of data points you can pull into and use that we maintain that you already own if, you know, in the AGOL. Uh, but what's powerful about this is you add your own data to it and can show you know, how it's impacting your community and help you make decisions. And we talked about the solutions page, esri.solutions, and take a look, I'm sorry, solutions.arcgs.com. And again, we'll send that link out so you can get to those. And then I wanted to review briefly that Kevin's um, insight analysis of that new station location. Again, these kind of functions can be done in the fire station, in AGOL. So you don't necessarily have to have that GIS professional doing it day to day. And I'll finish up uh, just by reminding everyone that in July we'll be in San Diego, and it's part of our users conference, which is our major conference every year. But preceding that conference is our National Security and Public Safety Summit. So it's three days or two days of, of public safety focused presentations. Um, a lot of fire, a lot of police, and some defense. So it's an excellent couple of days. You know, it's it's um, a lot of a lot of time for discussion and networking, those kind of things. So. If you don't have any plans that week, please come see us in San Diego for the National Security Public Safety Summit.